it was a wonderful time. A lot of people ask us, so how was it down there? Uh, I like to describe it as a traumatic experience, but one of the best things that we've ever done as a family. It has radically grown us um, in, in intimacy as a family. In fact, that's kind of part of the culture down there. That was one of the things that really stuck out to me. As soon as we got down there, any given moment, you can go out to a park and you'll see people, every from, everything from a little baby all the way up to great-grandparents, all spending time together in the park as a family. You would see grown men walking arm in arm uh, because one is the father, the other is the son. They just have this sense of respect for one another. And it was just really um, striking to interact with that, where you have people spending time together as a family all the time, wherever they go. And that was really encouraging, really fantastic for our families. Um, you know, I, I do want to mention... Um, uh, uh, Millie, I believe it is, turning 38. Well, we were, happy birthday. We're 38 as well. <laughs> um, and, you know, and the couple that's going to be getting married. Um, one of the ways that I uh, describe our time down there is, you know, once I got down there, I realized, obviously, I don't know the language. The only way you're going to learn the language is interacting with people and forcing yourself to speak it, right? And it became very clear that there were a lot of people who were in need of some encouragement with the scriptures and discipleship and so on and so forth. So as my wife mentioned, we had people in our homes regularly. But imagine, you know, as you're thinking about getting married, you spend, let's say, a year and two months, like in our case, getting to know this person, getting to know their deepest, darkest uh, problems, their, their, their weights in their lives, the things that really drive them. And you spend that time getting to know them and seeking to, you, you have plans to encourage and you're doing all of this. And then comes the wedding day and you say, oh, no, we're not doing this. Oh man, your heart would sink, right? Well, that's exactly what it felt like when essentially I functioned as a pastor for a year and two months. As, an, as a street evangelist who's always going place to place, now I'm stuck in one spot ministering to the, a lot of the same people over and over and over and then had to leave. It was like someone ripped my heart out. And for us, when we came back, it was a very difficult time upon our return. It was a lot to take in, a lot to just uh, process, and much we were not prepared to process through once we came back. Not to mention, since then, all of our brains kind of have like glitches now, right? We're like We go to speak and say something in English. It's like, oh, there was a word I would use for this back in my old life. What was that? You know, And it's almost like we disappeared for essentially two years and then come back and, you know, during that time... God was doing a work in our heart far more than just learning Spanish, while at the same time, everyone here is still growing with the culture as it's changing, and they have their own experiences, and then you come back, and you can't really communicate exactly what you went through, and so as a result, it, it, it makes, makes relationships here different. Everything is different now. And in fact, we don't want to go back to the way things were as far as ministry and life. We have this value of family, I think, even far more than we ever did. And um, I think it's enhanced our ministry greatly. Uh, upon our return, the boys and I went to New York City, and we were able to take the Word of Life Bible Institute students out and share the gospel. And while we were there, um, several times we were able to go all the way through the gospel with people in Spanish. Throughout the summer, as I've been out in the streets, many of my conversations have been in Spanish. I've been meeting people from Ecuador all over the place. And so, uh, matter of fact, our neighbor, um, she's Mexican, and She's starting to speak some English, but, you know, we've been babysitting her kids for years and different things like that. When we came back um, around Easter, I believe it was, she asked us to come over and give a Bible study. <laughs> and so we came over, and I learned more about her within that moment because it was all in Spanish than I did the entire eight years we were living next to each other. And so you think about Learning the language just so you can meet people where they're at and take them to the next step of what God is doing in their lives. So it's with that in mind, I'd like to go to Philippians chapter 2. If you could turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at the end of the chapter. 
And as you're turning there, I want to make mention, I want to say thank you so much for your partnership through prayer and finances that allowed this dream to even become a reality. Not only has it unlocked a whole other world of people that normally you hear them talk and you're just walking, you're, you kind of don't even really notice because you're, you don't know what to say, you can't say anything. Now there's this whole group of people that we can encourage that otherwise we would not have been able to. But not only that, it's transformed how we look at ourselves, how we look at people, and how we look at ministry. And I think this is going to reap great spiritual dividends in our ministry just in general. And so I, I want to thank you uh, for your partnership. Thank you for um, gifting us with the ability to get the, the computers that we needed that allowed the kids to maintain some relationships with their friends and is still happening while they're here. They still talk to their friends in Ecuador regularly. And so uh, that's been a blessing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we look at Philippians 2, we ask God that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, that as a result of us gathering together in your name, that uh, people would recognize that you are holy in our lives, that you are holy in our hearts, and that you are holy in our homes. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So we are in Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 25. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in re reading in verse 25. He says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ. He was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. So this is a often overlooked passage of Scripture. And this is Paul writing back to the church in Philippi uh, who supported him on his missionary endeavors. And it, the whole book is full of affection, full of love. He longs to see their faces. He longs to communicate to them the encouragement with which he's been encouraged. And he wants to see them face to face. And he plans to send Timothy, and he's like, if it all works, I'd like, I want to be there. In the meantime, he's sending Epaphroditus with the letter. And there's a reason why he's doing this. First of all, as we see in the passage, Epaphroditus is one of their messengers, somebody who was sent out by the Philippian church to assist Paul in his ministry. And in what way did he assist specifically as it's highlighted here? Well, he brought the financial gift that the Philippians had for Paul and his ministry. And in the context of this, in chapter 2, he's reminding the believers, as you work together, as you strive together for the sake of the gospel, and you all have the same mind of ministry, same mind of humility, that what you are doing has nothing to do with you, but it's about God and people being encouraged through what he's doing in you and through you. He says, you come together, you work out that salvation with fear and trembling. You come together and you work for the right purposes. And so we see in verse 25, he says that, Paul says that he also deemed it necessary to send the brother and co-worker. Epaphroditus is not only recognized as a brother in Christ, but he recognizes that Epaphroditus' missionary work was a co-labor work, a work on par with what Paul was doing. Epaphroditus, he's sending them 
uh, to them all as well. He describes Epaphroditus as Paul's fellow soldier, but the one sent um, from the Philippian church to minister to Paul's need. So they sent him out specifically with the task to minister to Paul's need. And then not only that, in verse 26, Paul says that the reason he deemed it necessary to send Epaphroditus back to the Philippian church was that Paul saw that Epaphroditus was longing to see them and was distressing because they heard that Epaphroditus was diseased. And then in verse 27, Paul says that Epaphroditus was indeed diseased almost to death, but rather God had compassion on him by healing him. God not only showed compassion to Epaphroditus by healing him, but he also showed compassion on Paul so that Paul would not have the grief of Epaphroditus' death on top of the grief of knowing how his death would affect the Philippian church. So imagine, the church sends Epaphroditus to minister to Paul's need. On the way, Epaphroditus gets sick. He's about to die. And the church knows the one they sent to minister to Paul is about to die. They know this information. They're concerned about it. And Epaphroditus, not only is he like, man, I got this gift. I got to get it to Paul. The work is counting on this. But also, he's concerned about the people back home. You see a lot of relationship in this passage. Some things to consider. If you sent a member from your midst to a gospel work, would they feel obligated? Would they feel motivated? Would they feel concerned about your concern for them? Do you have that kind of relationship with one another, that if one of your members left, it's not out of sight, out of mind, but your heart goes with them. See, you see this relationship developed as a result of ministering for the gospel. In verse 28, Paul says that, uh, says that is why he more eagerly sent Epaphroditus so that by seeing him again, the Philippian church might be caused to rejoice and Paul might be less grieved by knowing that the Philippian church knows that Epaphroditus is all right. Verse 29, Paul says that is why the Philippian church must receive Epaphroditus in the Lord um, and, excuse me here, um, with all joy and anticipation, and they must hold men like him in honor. And then lastly in verse 30, Paul says that the reason the Philippian church must hold men like Epaphroditus in honor is because he approached the point of death for the work of Christ after throwing aside care about his own soul so that he might make up for how the Philippian church lacked in ministering towards Paul. So imagine this. The reason why Epaphroditus is going He's bringing a gift. Imagine when my wife and I and our four kids were in Ecuador. And you didn't have things like Western Union or Word of Life Fellowship. And you didn't have all these digital means of receiving funds. And imagine we had a need to uh, be able to share the gospel and continue to pour into the people in Cuenca. And the only way we could get that need met is by your church sending that gift, and your church needed somebody to bring it. Number one, the first question is, would you be available? Number two, would you care? (laughs) And number three, if you were sent and you got sick along the way, what would be your greatest concern? Your health? Whether the gift got there or about your family back home, your spiritual family here that have been praying for you? What are you willing to disregard your soul for? Think about that. This is a pretty big passage, right? Are you willing to, quote unquote, send out your best for the sake of the gospel ministry? What kind of relationship do you have with one another? What are the things that bother you? Are you focused on the right things or focused on the wrong things? You know, I think of others in your midst who, as God has done a work in their life, there came a point in their life where they said, wow, I sense God 
wants us to do something radical and pour into somebody and invest in their lives so that they can do a work elsewhere. See, people look at what my wife and I are doing. They, oh, that's great. You guys are called by God. But is it possible that God could call you for a season, a time of need in this context, like Epaphroditus? What about you? The best av ability is availability. And I would like to, uh, excuse me for a moment here. I'd like to wrap up by summarizing what is motivating these people? What is motivating Paul to be willing to be incarcerated for the gospel? What is motivating Epaphroditus to risk his life to bring uh, finances so this gospel can go out? And what is motivating the church to even care about Epaphroditus? Like, okay, the gift is sent. Not my problem. <laughs> Not my work. <laughs> Not my health. Why are they concerned with one another? What is the foundation? Well, it's the gospel. It's the good news. The good news about how God created us in his image to know him and to enjoy him forever. The scriptures say that God is holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. That means God is good, pure, beautiful, and that sets him apart from you and I. Because even though we were created in God's image, we are descendants of Adam and Eve. We are born with hearts that want to go our own way and do our own thing. And because we are born sinners, we fall short of the glory of God. We don't measure up to God. And because of that, because God is holy and we are not, we are separated from him. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We are dead without the life of God in us. We don't know him personally. And if we die separated from God, one day we're going to be resurrected and thrown into the lake of fire. If you die separated from God, you don't get a second chance. And these people knew this. They were willing to risk their lives to bring the good news, the hope that each of us can have in Christ. And what is that good news? God didn't leave us in that situation. God became a man. His name is Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life for you and I. He was nailed to a cross, and when he was on the cross, he took what was separating us from his Father, and he put it upon himself. He died for our sins. He was buried in a grave after he shed his blood on the cross. And then three days later, he rose from the grave so that now if we turn from whatever is keeping us from trusting in Jesus, turn from our doubts that what he did was enough, turn from saying, well, I, okay, I believe that, but I'm going to just do whatever I want. I don't really care about God. No, turning to Jesus, recognizing he is all you have. He is all you need, and he can save you forever the moment you believe. This is the message we are proclaiming to people. You can know God personally and be forgiven forever. So, bless you. Here's my question for you today. What about you? At what point in your life has your ears heard your mouth call on Jesus saying, I believe you died for me and rose again? For those of you who do know Jesus as your Savior, what about you? What kind of ability do you have? Do you have availability? Are you willing to let God do whatever he wants with you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most high God, we praise you. You are a God who saves souls. You are a God who forgives. You are a God who changes us from the inside. Lord, as I think of my brothers and sisters in Ecuador, Lord, those who loved us, poured into us, shown great hospitality to our family, bless them with good health. Bless them with a passion for your gospel. Bless them with a desire to be available to you. I also pray for our family here at Pleasant View Family Church. Bless your people. Strengthen them for the task. 
cause them to be willing to lay their lives down, to throw their soul aside for your glory and because they love your people. For those who do not know you as Savior God, I ask God that you would move in their heart even right now, that perhaps from the pew they might even do what I did in the back of a pizza place. They might say something like this to you. Jesus, if you want me, you can have me. Lord, I praise you for this time, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.